everyone, we've got a black background today, which means that this video is going to be more on pedagogy and understanding teaching principles. And today I'm going to be referring to a research paper by the uh, amazing um, Professor Verna Kirkness and her 4Rs Theory of Indigenous Education. And understanding um, First Nations and Indigenous education is a really important thing because here in Canada, in particular, um, the education system um, has a pretty um, negative reputation throughout the history of Canada and the history of the colonial period in that um, through residential schools, the education system had a very negative role to play in terms of um, suppressing First Nations culture. And reconciliation has an important role to play that we need to think about intentionally how are we empowering uh, First Nations who participate in post-secondary education. And, uh, so Verna Kirkness is um, one of Canada's best leaders in this field and it was a real delight to find her paper and to read it and to assimilate it into my own teaching practice. So at the end of this video you will be able to discuss the cyclic and reciprocal role of the four R's in First Nations reconciliation in post-secondary education, define the four R's as respect, relevance, reciprocity, and res responsibility, apply the four R's to your own learning cycle, and appreciate the role of different learning strategies to accommodate diverse learning styles and socio-cultural frames of reference. What does that mean? Well, thinking about how do we apply reconciliation in the classroom not only has the benefit of being really respectful and really focused on um, strong integration of First Nations um, students who are participating in the classroom, but it also has spin-off benefits to every student in the classroom, that we are building a more respectful and resilient and um, a, a place that is welcoming for learning. So who is Verna Kirkness? She is a very remarkable uh, leader in education in Canada. She was born in 1935 in the Fisher River Cree Nation in Manitoba. She had uh, a career starting as a schoolroom educator and went on to work with the Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs and the Assembly of First Nations as an education advisor. She was one of the strongest advocates for um, integrating First, uh, First Nations language education as part of um, early childhood education and she um, wrote a wide variety of curriculum. She uh, also went on to work at the University of British Columbia and she was the founder of the House of Learning Longhouse which is a um, a home away from home for First Nations students who are participating in post-secondary education at the University of British Columbia. She is a member of the Order of Canada and has a good number of honorary degrees from uh, universities across, uh, across Canada for her um, advocacy and for her um, strong research and academic um, inquiry into how to really do uh, good service to the First Nations through the post-secondary education system. So, you know my black screens, I love to put in a quote from some of these wonderful leaders, and here's a quote from her paper. The very nature and purpose of higher education for First Nations people must be reconsidered, and when we do, we will find that the entire institution, as well as society as a whole, will be strengthened and everyone will benefit. I really like her philosophy about inclusive teaching and as much as uh, her teaching was about First Nations integration, it spins off and that integration is for everyone. So I am referring to her paper, uh, Kirkness and Barnhart, First Nations in Higher Education, the four R's, Respect, Relevance, Reciprocity, and Responsibility. This is uh, readily available online and I encourage people to find uh, a copy of this in PDF and take the time to read the whole document because it is a really good it's a really good summary study. Why do I care about this? Well um, every post-secondary educator should be thinking about how do you create a respectful and humanized teaching environment and it's so easy to think about teaching as 
delivery of knowledge, but it really is much more complex in terms of the relational aspect. And every school as part of the Truth and Reconciliation um, Commission was asked to take a time and reflect on opportunities for improvement. And many um, educators participated in that process. I was able to participate in some online programming and have done some workshops here on the campus. But I really feel that one of the most important things that we do as educators is think about the humanizing role of what we're doing. In Kirkness's paper, she talks about the existing function of post-secondary in that there is an aspect of ritual, that it is not just about that knowledge transaction. There is an aspect of transitioning from childhood into adulthood and that it is a ritual to go away and to be um, encouraged in the development of those uh, skills for adulthood. And so it is that almost leaving one previous state of life and moving into another previous state of life, that symbolism of post-secondary is really profound, that students are leaving the childhood homes that they have been in and they're stepping off into their, their adult life, including the career development that is there. But a lot of it comes into that integration of societal norms and society's mores, as she uses the term. The idea that you're becoming something more, not just intellectually, but also as a person. And so, yes, post-secondary's role is to synthesize and reproduce people towards a similar goal. You could say that you're pro creating professionals and within a field, but there's also those other societal, uh, or societal um, aspects of socialization, of being a good citizen and so on. The challenge with post-secondary is that it is become a system that's focused on effective and efficient policies so that people can be integrated as fast as possible. And that the effective and efficient aspect is really a very challenging word in this, in this paper because humanity is not efficient. <laughs> we would like it to be, but oftentimes we need to take the time to think about the human systems and the human reality of individuals to be able to serve them in their education um, journey. So um, in the second part of her paper, she thinks about the uh, existing model within there. Is post-secondary really realizing the equality and sharing opportunities of society through its mandate? Is post-secondary providing that collective social and economic mobility? Yes, ine inevitably post-secondary education is a lot about social and economic mobility, but in that process, is it overcoming neocolonialism? Are we, are we taking education and driving out people's um, view of culture and view of their community, a view of how they learn and so on. And so something that has been uh, challenged by a number of individuals in the Truth and uh, Reconcilia Reconciliation Commission has been the role that it's not up to First Nations to come and teach us as educators how to do it, but for us as educators to take a more active role and that we need to be active understanding the knowledge of First Nations and finding ways to integrate it into our classrooms. We need to be taking advantage of expertise and leadership that First Nations can provide, but also help young leaders from First Nations communities become that expertise and leadership that those communities themselves need. And last but not least, one of the key points is that we need to take time and understand the politics and history of racial discrimination within Canada and within the post-secondary system and be willing to face that fact and um, deal, with, deal with the fact that we've got to move forward in a positive way. So, Curtis's model focuses on a four-segmented wheel, and that uh, there's four elements, respect, relevance, reciprocity, and responsibility. I overlaid it on the First Nations medicine wheel, and it, I've seen it represented in this way in a few different sources. And so uh, respect and gratitude for the use of the medicine wheel in this format. Um, so respect, let's jump over to that one first. Um, within, within her document, she talks about 
the rule of respecting cultural integrity and cultural distance. That in some cases, you want to be really focused on integrating in First Nations practice within the classroom. But at the same time, in many cases, there's a cultural distance and not all practices are meant to be shared. Not all practices are meant to be um, broadcast within the classroom setting. Um, and that's something that I know that we have faced in uh, some of our challenges teaching at Niagara College, where I'm based, in that we try and do a lot of um, integrated classroom activities focused on First Nations, but we have to be really respectful that we're hearing the voices of the First Nations and respecting boundaries when something is ceremonial to, to uh, allow it to be a ceremony rather than turning it into a classroom lesson. Something that's uh, also prevalent in uh, post-secondary education is this I retire mindset that that anything less than what is coming out of that is a lesser thing. And I've seen this through um, many of our students who have tried to go on to additional post-secondary education. They are being trained up in a in a college program with a diploma credential, and they'll try and go on to additional um, learning and they're they're told well the learning that you have is great but it's only a college program and you have to go back to the beginning that ivory tower mindset and that hierarchy and almost a medieval tradition of post-secondary education has a lot of detriment in terms of accepting individuals with their prior learning and so there is that imposed value system and hierarchy on how people think and how people learn and how how the learning process occurs and it's really important to step out of those um, hierarchical boundaries that have been in place for a long time and understand that in many cases education and learning can occur through a wide variety of modalities that respect is really important let's move on to relevance here and uh, Within relevance, there's the aspect of appreciation and integration of non-settler and non-colonial knowledge systems. And I teach food science, and honestly, this is really important. It's something that I recognize in my own teaching, that in many cases, we take time and we acknowledge the technology that we are observing is actually derived from traditional knowledge from this culture. And we see the cultural pathway of traditional knowledge being appropriated by colonial mindset. And in many cases, there's an acknowledgement that it was done appropriately. And in other cases, there's an acknowledgement that it was taken over and appropriated through violence and through, through um, extremism. This is important. And food is, food is something that's uh, existential rights to everybody but at the same time a lot of the foods that we are um, appreciating on a daily basis were developed through the knowledge of many traditional systems many of those were first nation systems within north and south america but many of them were also traditional systems globally and we need to be really cognizant that traditional knowledge has a value to play within our um, environment we have to acknowledge that education is a service for development of the individual and as well as the community. It is not, edu uh, I have seen this in many cases where education almost sounds like a punishment, where someone gets a mark back or they get feedback from a teacher and that feedback is framed rather than a means of empowerment, but instead it comes across as a means of punishment and almost that the system is trying to uh, exclude people from participation and exclude people from knowledge acquisition. And so the aspect of relevance and empowerment of the individual and empowerment of the community is a really, really foundational part of this paper that we have to acknowledge that everyone has a slightly different learning path and as such we need to find ways to consistently be focused on that empowerment message. There needs to be within this relevance um, spectrum as well, an aspect of allowance for continuity of tradition within the vocational outcome. And so, yes, within a vocational outcome, you may say you must be capable of doing this, but how can you 
um, integrate tradition or integrate uh, cultural respect and cultural norms while still accepting the vocational outcome. So for example, perhaps not necessarily a First Nations requirement, but how are we integrating people who have different dietary restrictions based off of uh, cultural and or religious backgrounds? We're able to do that quite effectively and still meet the learning outcomes of a course. We find creative ways of doing that. We need to have fulsome conversations so that we are still fulfilling the vocational outcomes of our programs, but at the same time saying, when are the teachings that we are doing either integrating um, appropriate cultural touch points and cultural references, or when are we um, creating barriers? And are we able to find flexible means so that that relevant learning outcome is adapted appropriately? Step onto the reciprocity one. In, if you really think about it, education is not just a knowledge transaction where a teacher is imparting knowledge on the student, but it's a human-centered interaction and you're modeling all sorts of different behaviors and uh, societal norms and so on. That sense-making and skill building comes from the modeling of behaviors and attitudes within the community. And that reciprocity is really important, that, that students come in and are able to participate, but that teachers are also um, in a space where they're capable of being human beings. Something that's really important and was reinforced in the paper was that as much as that knowledge transaction is about delivering facts and figures and um, norms about how we are observing the world, whether that's through science or through language and culture, but that the real world is full of ambiguity, unpredictability, and complexity. And we have to be willing to live in that space and take the time to understand that that's a normal part of living and being. So, um, last point in this quadrant, that um, there's a relational interaction between the student, the teacher, and the system that they're learning in. And to be really focused on not just turning that into a bureaucratic system, but to allow it to be a human-centered interaction that's focused on fairness and focused on the human reality, that it's going to be full of ambiguity. And that's okay. Last but not least, responsibility. Oh, I've somehow lost a point there, but that's okay. We are not just focused on gaining education when it comes to responsibility. We're also gaining power and influence within society. As someone completes an academic credential, they suddenly have a different ability to leverage power when it comes to uh, seeking employment, seeking remuneration for skills, and so on. And so responsibility means that students shouldn't just be accommodated willy-nilly, but they should be accommodated into the classroom knowing that they have a really important role to play in becoming that, that uh, new and bigger person that emerges from post-secondary experience. Participation is important, both on the side of the student, but also on the side of the teacher, that the teacher has a responsibility to take the time and humanize the experience, take the time and find out how to personalize the education experience for the individual. So I'm going to leave you with a couple questions instead of leaving you with all the answers. How do we make sure that we're integrating this teaching as part of our education reconciliation process. I know from my perspective, I am very focused on nonlinear teaching. I'm also very interested in spending time on humanizing the teaching experience, that everyone has a different pathway and a different outcome that they would like to have, and how can we make sure that there's customization within the vocational outcomes that we have so that people can be their best self. Second question was, how does the classroom setting keep First Nations students in mind and value their contribution? As I mentioned before, something that I do in my food science teaching, I try to make sure that we 
really dig into the the food history of many of the technologies that we are that we are working on. I'm I'm looking at a cart of supplies from my classroom, and we were just talking about um, modification of starch, and we actually took time to learn about the nixtamalization process, and that this is uh, a food process that has been done by um, First Nations in North and South America for thousands of years. And meanwhile, we talk about manipulation of starch and manipulation of grains as if it's a uh, wild and wacky newfangled science. But honestly, much of the technology and the the manipulation of grain for improving its nutritional and uh, processing quality came from appropriation of First Nations uh, knowledge. And many of the foods that we enjoy on a daily basis came from appropriation of agricultural practices that First Nations were doing in North America and South America. And so being, um, being really mindful about that within our classroom and representing that history authentically as much as possible is really important to um, say to those students that the knowledge of their ancestors for thousands of years is still contributing today to our uh, sense of prosperity that we are experiencing here in North America. Last point I'm going to leave you with is how can Kirkness's lessons translate to improve post-secondary for all students facing barriers to participation? That aspect of humanizing and finding ways of uh, delinearizing the learning process is being really important to me. Um, participation is so important in that post-secondary education should be about empowerment across the board. If someone were to miss a class, they should not be penalized. They should be able to find a way to get back on track and continue their learning and uh, growing through that experience. And so for me, it's Part of it is finding ways to delinearize the process. Part of it is finding stepwise ways to really challenge students, but at the same time, break it down into learning um, bites that can be assimilated out of the linear learning process. This, uh, this journey of me making videos has been part of that delinearization to increase accessibility to all students. I think of the one of the instigators that encouraged me to do these videos, I had students who were bringing their video cameras into class. And when I asked them, they said, well, we can take your video and uh, all of the talking that you've done in class, we can run it through YouTube and closed caption it, and then we can translate it. And then we can have a better sense of what you're saying. And I laughed and laughed. And I mentioned this to some of my colleagues and they said, how dare you let them put it up on YouTube? And I'm like, wow, I'm actually impressed by their ingenuity. And so rather than uh, putting these barriers up, I said, you know what, would it make more sense for me to take the take home messages of my learning, put it up so everyone can participate. And so if someone missed that class, they've got my words right there in front of them. If someone had to step out of class because they had to take a call to hear from their school about a sick child or um, they weren't able to participate or maybe they were just having a bad day, my YouTube channel is very much about that. Reducing barriers to participation so that people can succeed. Post-secondary education is not meant to be a, a triage of the best versus the, the people who couldn't succeed. It's meant to empower everyone who wants to participate. And I'm trying to encourage participation across the board. Anyways, I always love your questions and I enjoy my journey of learning about learning as much as I do about learning about food science. I look forward to hearing your comments and I will talk to you again soon. Take care.